Thank you for joining us for this webinar for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Our focus today is on the MRC Psych exam, changes to the exam delivery this autumn. We have more than 1,200 people signed up to attend this afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone. My name is, my name is Ross Runciman and I'm chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee or PTC. I'm going to hand you over to Kate Lovett who's going to talk more um, about this exams webinar today. Kate, over to you. Thank you. The membership uh, exam of the Royal College of Psychiatrists has a long and proud tradition dating back over almost five decades. It's part of helping uh, fulfill the Royal College of Psychiatrists commitment to setting and maintaining standards for patient care and an important part of supporting parity of esteem. It's a hard exam, but can hold its head proudly amongst other postgraduate medical exams in the UK. Thank you for attending. Uh, I think the audience is mainly trainees, but I know that there are many trainers who are keen to know how they can support their trainees at the time. So thank you everybody for making time to be here. Training undoubtedly is the most challenging at the moment. I have never known such a challenging time in my entire uh, career. When it started in March to become obvious that COVID-19 was going to impact on every aspect of all of our lives in more ways than we could anticipate, it became obvious to me that there was no roadmap for how to nav navigate the situation. But my two guiding principles throughout in making decisions about what to do regarding training have been firstly to maintain standards for patient care and secondly to ensure that trainees are supported wholeheartedly and career options and choices not disadvantaged because of the pandemic. Thank you for all that all of you are doing to support each other, patients and services through this. Not a day goes by when I don't receive feedback from uh, heads of school and trainers around the country telling me how well you're stepping up to the challenges of COVID. You can be very proud of the way that you conducted yourselves through this. I completely understand the fear, the uncertainty, the strain and complications to life that COVID has brought upon us all. This webinar has been designed to lay just some of that anxiety relating to exams and clearly lay out our plans. I want to just say thank you to our exams team, our chief examiner, uh, Ian Hall, who you'll hear more from shortly, our heads of school training programme directors, our psychiatric trainee uh, committee, our commercial partners, and regulator the GMC, who we've all worked extremely closely uh, with and in collaboration through this. I'm delighted to say that the GMC have just announced uh, approval uh, for our plans for the written and clinical papers, which will now be laid out this afternoon in detail. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so. Um, we, we are going to have a, an excellent talk now by um, Ian, um, uh, as well as a demonstration um, of the CASC slightly later on by the provider. We're then going to also hear from um, our trainee rep, Stephanie Ewan, um, and thereafter move on to questions as well as reflecting on the future of exams. So at this point, um, as Kate indicated, kind of hand over to our chief examiner, uh, Dr. Ian Hall. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, hello, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Ross, and um, thanks everyone for attending. We're, we're pleased that uh, so many people uh, are attending. First thing I'd like to do is apologise for having to cancel those the diets of paper A and B and the uh, cask in Singapore. Uh, obviously, we had to do that because of the, the COVID pandemic, but uh, I know that it's disrupted people's lives uh, considerably, uh, and so do definitely apologise for that. We've been um, working very hard to try and think what, what to do about it, as, as Kate was saying, and, um, and exactly how we're going to run things. We're going to talk about the CASC first, and then we're going to talk about the written papers. 
Um, so as uh, I'm sure uh, most people know, CASC is our clinical exam. It's a 16 station OSCE uh, style exam. And um, yeah, we've worked out how we're working out how we can deliver that. We did look, as some, a lot of uh, trainees have suggested to us, of running a socially distant option uh, for the CAS. But actually, that uh, when we when we worked it all out, it it actually wasn't possible because it's a it's a huge logistical exercise running an exam like that. And it's not just about running the exam; it's about the hotels, the travel, all those extra sort of things. People from needing to shield all that sort of thing. So, so although we evaluated it, actually that, that's not the road we're going down. So as we've um, put on the website uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we are, are going to run a CASC exam based on video uh, consultation. So that's, that's the way uh, that we're going um, to do it. Um, and as Kate says, I'm very pleased the GMC have approved uh, this uh, just in the last week or so. Um, so uh, the, but one of the reasons the GMC approved it was because uh, we're really uh, going to implement the same exam, but just using a, a different um, platform. So hopefully, uh, people will find this um, will find this reassuring. I'm just going to uh, just uh, show you a little bit on the website um, uh, now, just to show uh, what it says about the exam. So uh, hopefully, people are familiar with the uh, exams. Uh, pages there and uh, we are going to run the CASC exam using exactly the same format and blueprint uh, that we uh, run the existing uh, exam. So uh, if you've not checked that out yet, this is under preparing for uh, exams and under preparing for the CASC here. It goes through the format about there being uh, 16 stations, there are two circuits, uh, how long they last, how long you have to prepare. Uh, we have five history stations, five exam stations, six management stations, uh, uh, and uh, it says when, when they occur in the exam. And then I think really important, I, having spoken to lots and lots of trainees preparing for the um, exam, they don't always see this, perhaps because we put it at the bottom here, but really important is the CASC uh, blueprint uh, there. And there it really tells you what, what we're going to cover uh, in the exam. It says all that's about the history and management stations again. It's saying, uh, it says about the range of settings. So if you've just, so you need to need to think about this because we, we, we say it can, the, the, the scenario can be in any setting and give a, a whole list of examples there. So that's good to get experience of as you're preparing. And it's also going to be patients of any age, any developmental ability, and any psychiatric disorder you'll recognize, this is the list of uh, chapters more or less from ICD-10 uh, there. So any psychiatric disorder um, and uh, people with any developmental ability. We uh, also so give you more information. So we'll definitely have uh, stations on psychopathology, one about risk, uh, one about cognitive capacity assessment, one on psychotherapy, uh, old age, one with a developmental theme and one on physical health. So. So um, that, that hopefully helps people um, prepare for that. And I definitely recommend looking at that. So we will, the, the exam that we have, which, which we've already set, um, will um, cover the blueprint uh, the, way that, uh, the way that we always do. We've had a couple of uh, questions about, um, about uh, physical, exam, uh, physical health stations. So obviously on a video consultation, format, uh, some stations about physical health you can do and some you can't do. So uh, and the, the exam panel at the moment are checking the exam that we've set to make sure that all the stations that we have are possible for video consultation and if they're not we'll substitute them for um, other stations. And similarly with some of the cognitive stations as people have pointed out uh, you may not be able to um, deliver on a video consultation format so we'll, we'll, we'll change those as well. Um, the uh, The, um, so the, sorry, uh, just a couple more things I wanted to say about the CASC. Uh, we uh, are expecting uh, quite a high demand for the CASC uh, this time. That's partly because we cancelled Singapore CASC. Uh, and also, as people may know, we varied the entry criteria to uh, help address problems for people who weren't able to sit written papers. 
Um, so we are expecting high demand and we, we have a limited capacity. So we're going to allocate first come first serve. We know lots of people, we opened the application period yesterday. We know lots of people have um, uh, are already in the, either finished their application or in the process of doing it. Um, and we are looking at uh, extending capacity and offering a, a fifth uh, a fifth day as well. So, so hopefully that will address that, but, um, but, but, the, but the capacity is limited. I think that's probably all I'm going to say about the CAS now. We can maybe come back to it in questions, but I wanted to make sure we had time for a bit of a demonstration of the platform we're using, just because people, to so give people a bit of a better um, idea uh, about that. So I'm going to hand over to Will uh, now, who's going to do that for us, who's from uh, uh, Fry, who's our, our commercial um, uh, partner uh, to deliver this. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I've been unmuted now. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, for, for that introduction. Um, and and yes, yeah, so so absolutely, we're just going to uh, sort of run through a uh, very brief demonstration of of the platform um, that we offer to, to institutions like uh, the college uh, to deliver their uh, sort of uh, these styles of exams remotely. Just before I launch into that, just to give um, a very brief introduction as to kind of who we are. So um, Fry is a company based in in the UK. Um, that specialises in, in uh, providing assessment solutions for um, the healthcare sector. So that means, in essence, we work with uh, undergraduate medical schools and rural colleges. Um, so we're very much focused on uh, these sort of solutions that, and, that enable um, the particular requirements of, of healthcare assessment. Um, and as part of that, and as part of our response to coronavirus, we've been working with these institutions to expand out and, and sort of uh, facilitate these, uh, these examinations to continue as best as they can. Uh, during this period. Um, so we've been working with uh, the college closely to, uh, to to fulfill the requirements and make sure that the CASC exam can be uh, delivered sort of robustly and securely on our platform. I'm going to very briefly go through the process for the candidate login to the system um, and we'll sort of uh, go through the, the process of, of uh, uh, you know showing the exam content etc. So here I'm um, Granted, you know, first met with a candidate ID and password. So I'm going to enter my credentials here now. And I log into my exam and it downloads the exam for me there. I'm then granted and, and, and have, uh, I'm asked for a pin code for the examination. So that first stage that we went through there can be done ahead of the time. And all that's going to do is that's going to download all the material and content for your exam ahead of the exam time so that that's then sec stored securely on your computer. Um, the reason we do this is that during the exam you don't need to down be downloading uh, you know PDFs uh, and, and materials sort of as the exam's ongoing. I then enter in order to access the exam a secure pin. So here in this example this is 065058 and my exam is now decrypted. Um, I'm then held on a screen uh, before going in and uh, I'm just going to launch into my exam here. So I'm brought through to my uh, exam interface and I'm taken straight to my uh, first station. So the exam, the, the system has a full understanding of the rotation of the order of the, the stations that you'll go through for the CASC exam. Um, and that will be personalized to each candidate. So it's, it's already uh, organized. You don't need to go through anything to pick up any, uh, any stations that you'll be assessing. Um, in order to start my examination, I'm going to click connect up at the top bar. And what this is going to do, this is going to start my uh, video connection. Uh, in order uh, to actually capture and, and sort of uh, so I can speak with uh, the candidate and the examiner um, going through. I believe my uh, colleague uh, is Grace is going to be uh, joining and playing the role uh, of an examiner, um, uh, which, which we'll be joining shortly to do. So uh, Grace has joined here as the examiner role um, and we see some more information here. So we see the connection time uh, that we're going and, and sort of what we've been talking over for our call. And also we've now unlocked our candidate instructions document. So this document is uh, the guidance you'll be provided with and any materials uh, required for the exam will be included on the platform here. So as a candidate, um, I can see my examiner, I can converse with them, we can, uh, they can hear me and I can hear them vice versa, and I can view any relevant materials for this as well. Um, of course, for the CASC, one of the other the constituent parts is, is, is the, the role player or, or the simulated patient. Uh, and that's, that will just be a third video box um, on, on the sort of view here as well. 
So you'll be able to see the, the yourself, the candidate, and uh, sorry, yourself, the examiner, uh, and, and the simulated patient at the same time. We then complete the assessment as you, as you work through the station. Um, and then once you've completed that, you then simply just have to uh, go on to your next station and it's queued up for you by clicking next. So once we've completed our assessment, um, I come in here, I click next, um, and then I'm brought through to my next station. Um, now in this, we haven't got an examiner sort of joining in, I'll just click connect again. Um, so if I had an examiner, they would join me in, we go through uh, the, the, the next station and work through the stations uh, across the exam. Um, this obviously process is repeated for, for the multiple stations. And then once I'm finished, the last thing I do is I just go back and click log out for my exam. Um, and I'll just click finish now. Um, once I've completed the exam, uh, all of the, the marks are recorded by the examiner. Um, and that process is what you'll go through in order to, to access the exam. Um, just to give some reassurance, so absolute full guidance, training materials, practice exams will be available as part of the implementation process. Um, so we'll have, uh, you know, very clear instructions in terms of requirements um, uh, on your device and, and sort of the systems that you have and where you can access this from. Um, and that will be sort of shared via the college. So going forward. Um, so, yeah, so that was just a very brief uh, sort of overview of, of the solution in terms of the level of interaction that will be required for you uh, for in order to sort of deliver the exam. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much for that, Will. Yes, and those uh, system requirements, I think, are already up. Uh, it, when you're applying for the exam, you'll be able to see what the system uh, requirements are. Okay, so now I was just going to talk briefly about the uh, what we're planning for the uh, written papers. Um, uh, we've been planning for some time to move to uh, uh, computer-based testing for the written papers. But obviously, since the COVID uh, epidemic, we've, we've really accelerated that, and, and it's our plan to deliver paper A and paper B um, using uh, computer-based testing in the uh, autumn um, on the uh, existing uh, exams calendar, although we maybe have to move the dates a tiny little bit, depending on capacity. Um, so we were a bit vague before about how we were going to do that, but now it's much clearer. So the, the, the principal way we'll deliver the uh, exam will be um, through people doing it on their own devices, either at, either at home, preferably, probably, or, or, or work. Um, and uh, obviously, again, for that, we'll, we'll, we'll publish system requirements uh, and enable people to test their, their, their systems before, before they do it. Um, it's, we may have a small number of test centre places uh, available uh, as well, but uh, we, we would not encourage people to use these unless there's very good reason because uh, of the, um, the possibility of second wave of the, uh, of the pandemic, because if that happens, um, all the online places may be taken at a late stage. So we definitely encourage people to, um, to, to use the uh, doing it at home uh, option on their own device. I think just like the uh, previous, uh, uh, the previous um, uh, about with the CASC exam, we are going to implement exactly the same exam. We've actually already set the papers, the first papers that we're going to use. So the it'll be the same uh, questions that we uh, that we had planned to do. So they will be uh, they will be following the blueprint and the uh, curriculum, uh, which is, again is on the. Um, uh, oh, I can't share my screen. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so we'll follow the blueprint that is in that preparing for exam section on the website uh, and follow the syllabus, the exam syllabus uh, as well, uh, as, as we always do. Um, we will make one or two changes, um, which uh, in terms of how it's delivered. Uh, and this is uh, really big to ensure uh, uh, probity and make sure people don't cheat. So um, one is that we will deliver the questions uh, in a random uh, order, possibly within sections, but different candidates will get the questions in a different order. And we're also, I think, going to randomize the answers, whereas uh, at the moment we give them alphabetically because this, this just puts another layer of uh, security there. Uh, we're also going to use two forms of proctoring. So proctoring is again making sure people don't cheat. Uh, so uh, we will have we'll use artificial intelligence to look at uh, to look at, for example, where people are looking, what their behaviour is like, uh, 
but we will also use live proctors, so people watching uh, candidates through um, webcams um, uh, as well. And uh, if the AI triggers something, then obviously the, the live person can look and see what it's about and see if there's if there's suspicious behaviour. But we've had a few, uh, in terms of questions submitted, we've had a few questions about this and people anxious that we do have uh, proper security on the exam um, so that they don't feel other candidates have an, unf an unfair advantage uh, over them. The other thing is, because uh, it's a three hour exam or longer for people with extra reading time, we are going to uh, introduce breaks into the exam. So we will put the, uh, we'll put the exam in sections, in, ti in timed uh, sections, so uh, that they will have a break and then return to it. Because we, we don't want people to leave the room while, while, they've, uh, while they're actually doing the exam, because again, that's a, that's a, a security um, risk. So I think that's the um, uh, those are the that's the main things I wanted to say about the uh, about the written papers. We can again return to them uh, in the questions and answers at the end. But uh, we uh, we haven't got a demonstration ready just yet because we've just finalised the details with the provider, which is Pearson View, which is a very well known provider of um, of, uh, of uh, computer based testing. Um, but we will have uh, we will put a, 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 a practice exam up on the um, up on the website. Okay, so that's uh, what I want to say for the moment. I now want to introduce uh, Stephanie Ewan. Or were you going to introduce Stephanie Ross? That's fine. Well, I, I was Ian. Uh, I yeah, was just going can. to say yeah. Th do. Thanks very much, Ian, Will, and Grace. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Ewan who is the trainee representative on the college's examination subcommittee and is also an SD5 trainee in psychiatry of intellectual disability at South London and Maudsley. So Stephanie, to bring us the trainee's perspective on these exam changes, I'd be really grateful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Ewan, I'm the trainee rep. Thank you for the um, introduction, Ross, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so firstly, I'm sure the change in the delivery of the exams <clears throat> to being online is generating a sense of unease or possibly full-blown terror in some of you. So I thought it might be helpful just to consider how you might prepare for the exams. Um, so for paper A, paper B and the CASC, in terms of the learning of content, the curriculum and the question style will not be changing, so I would recommend using the same resources you usually would. However, I think there are additional considerations if we work from the assumption that you will be sitting the exam from your own homes. Some of these may seem really obvious, so please bear with me. Um, hopefully there's something useful in here for you. Uh, firstly, the setting. So you will need to identify a room where you won't be interrupted and able to set up a desk and chair, for example. So you might need to start thinking about um, you know, having discussions with family or flatmates um, to, to enable that to happen. Um, secondly, you're going to be sitting the exams on your own computer. So you need to make sure that your computer is working and you, you have it attached to a charger on the day. Um, it will be via the internet. So again, I know it sounds obvious, but uh, to make sure you have a strong enough internet connection. Then there are specific considerations with regards to the platform system requirements and the platform's testing. And so the list of IT requirements for the CASC have already been uploaded um, and IT requirements for the written papers are expected to be uploaded um, at the opening of the October paper B application window. So I would really recommend that you look at these as soon as it's made available to you. Um, something also worth considering is that work devices are likely to have firewalls, so it's probably better to use a personal computer if you possibly can. In addition to this, uh, the details of the operational aspects of the exam days are still to be confirmed. Um, and it's anticipated that this information will be shared both via the college website and by email. Again, please read these and ensure you know how to access the platform, the latest time you can actually gain access to the platform on the day and how to get assistance if you have any technical issues on the day. Um, yeah, these are not, you don't want to be failing your exam for, for those reasons, you know. Um, then there are some considerations specific to the CASC. 
So firstly, in terms of technology requirements, you will need um, a working camera, microphone and speaker and to allow the platform to access these. Um, and there, as we've said earlier, there's um, the full list of requirements um, already up uploaded as part of the application. Secondly, with regards to the setting, I would think about the lighting in your room and also positioning of the camera to ensure that the patient can see your face clearly. It's worth keeping in mind that in terms of body language, uh, the patient will really only be able to see your facial expressions. So it might be worth considering recording yourself, doing a couple of practice stations and watching them back to see if there's any tweaks you'd like to make to your communication style. Uh, thirdly, although you are not sitting the exam in a work setting, it is important to foster a sense of professionalism. So I would dress as smartly as for previous casks. I would also think about what the patient can see behind me. So if there's anything you wouldn't want a patient to see, take it down um, and also make sure kind of pets aren't visible or people aren't walking back and forth across your screen. Uh, furthermore, with regards to practicing the cask stations with your peers, I would encourage you to do at least some practice via video platform so that you feel comfortable with the format. Uh, I suppose one last thing, I know when I was doing my exams, it sometimes felt as though the people who set the exams were this rigid, anonymous organisation trying to catch me out. Um, but I just want to reassure you that that is most definitely not the case. The examinations committee are really keen to hear and respond to trainee feedback and they proactively ensure that there is trainee representation at all their meetings and in recent weeks they've confirmed that the autumn exams will be sat online and that there will be trainee input in the testing phase of the examinations platform and of course they've waived the requirement to pass the written papers before sitting CASC as well and these are all in efforts to minimise the impact of the cancellation of exams on um, your career progression. Um, so I appreciate this is already an extremely challenging time, but I just want to reassure you that they are trying to support trainees in being able to sit and pass their exams. Um, so thank you for listening and please do get in touch with any questions and feedback following the webinar because um, yeah, we, we, we want to hear it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, so I should have said at the start, and I apologise, uh, thank you kindly to everyone for submitting the questions uh, when registering. Um, all, all on the panel have, have been reading them. Luke and I were reading them last night um, along with Stephanie. Um, we'll be collating an, uh, all of these questions asked before the webinar today and adding them to the growing frequently asked questions found on the exams page, uh, the link to which is found uh, currently in the chat feed of this webinar. And, and this will be accompanied by a recording of the webinar. So at this point, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Luke Baker. He is Vice Chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee, and he's going to lead in answering um, your questions. Luke. Thank you, Ross, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Luke, as Ross has said, I'm the Vice Chair of the PTC. It's great to be with you today, uh, and I hope you've found the webinar useful so far. As Ross has said, thank you to everybody who submitted questions prior to the webinar. Um, we've selected a number of those questions covering broad themes that I'm going to put to our panel now. We are also reviewing the questions as they come in during this live webinar, and I'll be sure to ask some of those too. Just to be clear, there are no planted questions. Um, we've tried to cover as many different themes as possible. I'm sorry if your question isn't directly answered, but rest assured, as Ross has said, we will answer them as soon as possible and put them up on the website. The questions submitted so far fall into the following broad themes. The format of the exam, physical stations, examination fees and refunds, technical issues, concerns about cheating, communication skills, provisions for candidates requiring adaptations and a miscellaneous section. So without further ado, let's move on to the first questions. And I would kindly ask the panel, please, to be as succinct and brief as possible um, so that we can get through as many of them as we can. So question number one, and I think this goes to Ian, first of all, please. Um, how was standard, um, standard long? long. Sorry, I had Sorry, to stop again. Say again. How will standards online be compared with face-to-face -face CASC in terms of scoring, given that online presents different challenges to candidates? Yeah, so we'll be using exactly the same uh, way of marking the CASC that we do, which is called domain-based marking. So we mark in three broad domains and give a uh, and give an overall uh, judgment score as well, which is used to work out the pass mark. So the detail of that is all on the website under a fair exam, and we're using 
exactly the same system. I do appreciate that uh, video consultations are a bit different uh, from live consultations and the communication skills are, are a little bit different. So we'll, 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 we will be adjusting that in terms of uh, marketing those, those sort of domains. But I think Steph was very wise to say, yes, I think candidates should practice video consultations under supervision, which is actually quite easy to do when the supervisor is there. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, do that as part of their as part of their prep. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ian, for that. Um, another question that's come in that a few people have asked is: Can the college kindly upload a virtual sample exam station uh, for people to see how best to um, do the task? Um, so we have videos on, on the website already of uh, two cask stations and we also have an example construct on the, uh, on the thing. Well, I was, yeah, I'm not promising this, but one thing we could look at is a video of someone doing it on the video platform. Is that, that's what you're suggesting, is it? Yeah, yes. let's have a look yes. at it. We'll have a look at it. Perfect. Thank you, Ian, for that. Um, just moving on to another theme now about examination fees and refunds. And again, this has come up from quite a few trainees. Um, will the cost of the CASP and written papers remain the same? I think Kate might like to ask this one in broad terms anyway. Do you want yeah. to, Kate? So, yes, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so... Um, with the examination um this is new for us so there's an awful lot of investment having to go into creating a brand new uh, exam um, and we've been committed to ensuring that uh, the fees are no more expensive than they already are um, uh, but we need to make sure that it's a sustainable exam uh, and that we can develop it, uh, you know, so that it is, 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 is a high quality exam uh, and that people have a very good user um, experience. So our plan is to keep the fee structure exactly uh, as it is. Great. Thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Lovett. Moving on um, to some anxieties now that some of our um, trainees have raised with us um, and thinking about technological issues that may come up. So one popular question has been, um, what happens if there's a technical snag in the midst of a station? Will, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the platform itself um, is built on and, and, and been sort of used very robust technologies uh, in terms of uh, you know accessing and managing uh, the system itself. Um, we're you know we well tried and tested with, with sort of technology. However, we also recognise that there is, there is, um, there is um, an element of uh, you know a dependency on internet connection and, and robustness in terms of that. So what we we do in terms of the soft side is be very fault tolerant. So. For example, we now use to, to reconnect to tools um, if there's any interruption and um, for the, the actual exam to be uh, really created as needed with uh, by the examiner. With by the examiner. So I'm getting a little bit of feedback from my line. Yeah, you were cutting out slightly. Apologies for that. So, so yes. Yeah, so, so in terms of the, the the real key thing that will come down, the the candidate's device needs to find the browser, and the kind of the operating system for for the operating system for for the platform. Well, yeah. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. Could you maybe mute me and just have Will on? Thank you. Oops, sorry, sorry. Apologies for that. So, so yes. So, I was, I was just saying that um, the, uh, the the key thing is making sure that candidates' devices meet those minimum requirements, um, both in terms of you know system updates um, and the actual device itself. So, making sure there's a webcam, uh, microphone, etc. Um, the platforms are built on uh, very robust technologies that have been well tested. You know, we we deliver many thousands of assessments um, a year across the sort of medical uh, sort of uh, sector. Um, so yeah, so so we absolutely um, you know it's at the forefront of minds in terms of that that sort of robustness and resilience of the technology and being fault tolerant, so allowing people to reconnect to them, uh, uh, you know, and, and the exam to continue through the rotations. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, 
Yeah, so um, at the Catholic in Sheffield, uh, sometimes things go wrong as well. Uh, and uh, so we do, so we have systems in place, for example, um, uh, you know, we, we occasionally rerun stations for people where something has gone wrong in the station, um, uh, which, which we couldn't foresee. So, so we're building in those sorts of contingencies uh, as well in our planning for, for delivery in September. Um, I don't know if Richard wants to say anything about the written papers in terms of uh, in terms of answering that question with Vols. Yes, I'll be ha I'm happy to. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'll be ha I'm happy to. Uh, thanks. So yes, maybe it, introduce it, yourself, Richard. So, yeah, so Richard from Pearson, who's uh, yeah, I'd say our partner. My apologies. Yeah, so uh, work with Pearson View and the uh, written papers for the online assessments as well as the test center exams we've run through our, our, our centers. Mm -hmm. Um, for the online exams, I think one of the most important, uh, just in addition to what Will has said there, as well as the platforms being quite robust, the requirement for the internet connectivity because the online exams are global are quite low. Um, so that, you know, irrespective of where a candidate is, um, you know, the, the demand, or if you like, or the drain on, on uh, the network would, should, wouldn't be as strong. Um, so hopefully it will mean, um, you know, a lot more people will be able to run the exam successfully. But more importantly, one of the most important elements we recommend to candidates before confirming registration, or at least at the point of registration, would we'll have a tool called a system check tool that will allow all candidates to self-run um, the tool, and it does a major check. It checks the computers meet the minimum requirements, the bandwidth on the network is adequate to uh, uh, to successfully run the exam, but also the webcam is of the right uh, um, quality. Uh, what that does is it, um, it will basically just give you a simulation and provide you with green ticks, or if there are any issues, it'll flag it to the candidates and then you can make any adjustments before the day of exam. 95% of the time, maybe more, if candidates successfully run that system test, then uh, the experience on the day of the exam will be smooth. So highly recommended. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard and Will and Ian for answering those questions. Um, I suppose coming off that a little bit is around the CAS more than the written papers. And people have uh, made the point that small, subtle movements, such as movement of the head when they're responding to the patient, may not be picked up if someone's internet connection is maybe not as good as others, or it may appear less smooth uh, and less natural. Will there be allowances for that for candidates with maybe worse connections and worse computers? Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so. Uh, this is detailed on the website as well if you want to have a look, but with, when we run the CASC, we do a, a very thorough standardization of the station beforehand. So the examiners meet for half an hour or more, and then they have a further meeting with the role player. So the whole process takes about an hour where they discuss exactly how we're going to score it and exactly how we're uh, going to evaluate the different domains. So, um, uh, and that's led by uh, experienced examiners or people on our exam panels running those meetings of examiners. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, obviously we'll do it by video conference uh, for this exam, um, but, um, uh, and we will explicitly discuss those issues and uh, how we're assessing communication uh, using the video conferencing platform. So, so yeah, so exactly, so, that, so we will make those adjustments, yes. Great, thank you very much, Ian. Um, Dr. Lovett, I think maybe this is uh, a question for you and maybe Ian together. Um, at the start of this, you mentioned um, how important these exams, exams are and the history of them. Um, Ian has already talked about guarding for cheating, I suppose, in the written papers. But I'm wondering what's going to be introduced to um, eliminate or reduce that risk for the CASC exam. So yeah, I mean, um, um, cheating is extremely, you know, uh, important how we proctor uh, the exam, and, and Ian's probably able to talk 
uh, more about the detail um, of that, but I know that um, there are um, extensive um, uh, discussions uh, and safeguards being built in uh, with our commercial partners who have extensive um, experience, um, you know, operating these kind of exams. This is not the first uh, clinical exam that will be um, held um, online, and our, our, our partners have um, lots of experience of that. Um, and before this all kind of you know goes live, we will need reassurances uh, as officers in the college and the board of trustees that this is a robust, safe exam. Um, but but Ian is probably able to talk uh, more on the detail of that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Of course, I've gone through with the uh, written papers. Uh, for the CASC, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it gives us some different issues. I think, uh, so it's not absolutely finalised yet, but what we're thinking is, yes, we'll have, we'll have invigilators in every virtual room of the, of the CASC who will be observing the candidate as well as performing uh, uh, various other functions uh, for us and dealing with any incidents that arise. Yeah, I think we're, we're planning on, you know, having a high level of, uh, of observation and support like that. People have asked about uh, note-taking, so having discussed it uh, with, um, with various people, I think you know, to do a clinical exam, you do need to be able to take uh, paper notes, don't you? So we're, we're working out a way that we can we can allow that without um, without uh, people cheating. So yeah, so we'll we'll be doing that. So is that likely to involve room scans? I think Kate's got another thing she wants to say. Yeah, it it, it was. So just just to say, I mean, in terms of cheating in a clinical exam. It's really hard to do if you haven't prepared, if you can't, you know, um, interview a patient, um, you're not going to be able to cheat on the day to make the difference between you passing and failing. And we've got very good evidence for that from our national recruitment, where we actually publish uh, the, the clinical scenario online ahead of the, uh, the, 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 the day of interview. Everybody knows what they're going to be asked. Uh, but it's, it remains a very good discriminator between the people who can do that well and, and the people that really struggle. I guess the most important uh, thing in terms of um, sort of proctoring is to make sure that people turning up to do the exam are the people that they say they are. So, so it's about making sure that we have uh, very, uh, very high level um, identification checks. Uh, yeah, maybe Richard could just say that uh, how the identification works on Pearson. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so with the written exams, it will be a two-step process. So as we've said, um, there will be a kind of uh, ID verification or identity verification process um, before and only after a candidate successfully goes through that process will they then be passed on to unlock the exam and start the sitting. The ID pro verification process itself, uh, we recommend that uh, candidates present with a passport or driver's license, a national passport or license. Um, and the process itself is uh, facilitated using artificial intelligence. So uh, it will do a quick three uh, stage uh, check in about two to three seconds. It will check that the ID document presented is valid. It will check that the face of the document is valid. Um, against the national database uh, uh, used to issue the passport and also check that the name on the ID matches the details of the candidates who has registered to take the exam. Again, all these three steps happen in two to three seconds using artificial intelligence. Um, if that automatically passes, then the candidate is allowed to proceed to continue to you know, do the environment checks and start the exam. If for any reason, uh, and we see this uh, often, um, there is any discrepancy, say, for example, an extra undeclared middle name or, you know, slight subtle misspelling of the name uh, is detected using this automated check. Uh, we also have human greeters who will then uh, be able to look into that, either engage the candidates um, if it's uh, uh, if they can remediate that, they, they will. Uh, but if there are significant uh, issues with the ID and who we expect to show up um, again, that at that point the exam could be terminated potentially if there's significant discrepancy and an incident will be reported to the college. Uh, but usually the automated process works 
uh, but will securely validate that against the national database of very IDs. Great, thank you so much for that, Richard, uh, for that that answer about how how you, Pearson will try and uh, keep that exam secure for candidates. Um, panel, I've got three questions that I'd really like to ask you, and I'm aware that we are running out of time for this section, um, so I would appreciate if we get through them all. So brief question, uh, brief answers, please. Um, I think this one is uh, to you, Ian, first of all. I think you have covered it, but there's still some questions, so it would be good maybe if you could answer it in a bit more detail coming through about what will happen if uh, there is an internet disruption during the CASC exam and um, the candidate loses the connection to the exam. What will, what will happen to them at that point? So uh, what we're thinking is, uh, yeah, so a very, a very small interruption, which doesn't really disrupt the, the flow too much, I think would be fine. We'd record it as an incident, but basically uh, uh, that would be that would be okay. Um, uh, if the station is not valid, then uh, then uh, hopefully we'd be able to offer a rerun. There's obviously a limited capacity for that, but um, hopefully we would be able to do that. Um, and if there's a complete outage. Uh, then yeah, we, then obviously you need to sit the exam um, another time. So um, an exact, we're still working out the details of how how that might happen. Um, yeah. So um, I suppose well, I would return to both what Will and Richard said, which is make sure you do the test beforehand and make sure you have got um, have got a secure connection. You know, there's you know there's also site disaster management. I mean, if there's a huge power cut in London that day or, or, or in another big city and it affects lots and lots of candidates then you know we just have to start from scratch again don't we but but um we will be able to manage uh yeah the yeah the the, the smaller things that happen on the day i hope yeah great thank you very much um the penultimate question then um for the panel uh, and this has come in live on the webinar um if the exams can now be taken online why is it the college aren't doing anything to increase the number of written exam diets? And the trainee that's asked that has mentioned the impact that's having on progression to training and parity with other rural medical colleges. Um, I wonder if I can direct that both to the chief examiner and the dean, please. Well, you want to start, Kate, I don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, so we we know that trainees want this. We know that trainees want more diets of the exam, and um, so you know it's something that we we think about. Yeah, it's quite. A, I think unless you've been involved in exams and actually has, has been involved in the exam committees and staff as well, um, I think as a trainee, certainly I have no idea of the, all the processes you need to go through to make sure it's a fair exam, to make sure that you're setting the right standard, to making sure the questions are appropriate to answer, all, all, all that sort of thing. Um, so it's, there's a lot of work in producing each paper. It's not a question. I think sometimes I think people think we just press a button at the college and it generates a paper and that's it and it's, it's it's not like that at all so if for the same number of candidates to uh, to produce more papers that probably would increase costs to a certain extent um, um, but on the other hand uh, with the with the online delivery platforms um, it might be it might be easier to do and we might we might be able to do it so it's certainly something we're looking into I'll let Kate I wonder if Akshay wants to comment on it as well because it's, he has had that training perspective on the um, on the panels yeah, I Maybe think I think the, yeah. So Ian, I think I think you're right. Um, before before I, I I was anything involved with examinations, I I didn't I had no idea of how complicated the process was. And uh, Steph and I have been sort of chipping in with sort of a trainee's point of view and a trainee's perspective, um, where wherever we can. And we're actually quite lucky that in the college that there is so much trainee inputs into everything that goes on um and obviously if there is any feedback can't come and tell people on the ptc and it will it will come back to the college and we can we can look into it and we always want to change things to make it better for trainees because ultimately the trainees are the, are the next generation of members aren't they do you have anything to add so 
Yeah, so I mean, just really to back up what um, uh, Ian and Ashley have said, uh, it's a matter of resources. Um, you know, we've got a tiny exam team. I think most people would be shocked uh, when they saw the size of the the exam department when you say department have sort of visions of a floor full of you know uh, people um it's a very tiny number of of, of of staff and uh you know the exam uh, requires staff time uh, to deliver but it also um depends on the time of volunteers to make the exam so all our examiners are volunteers they don't get paid for the work they're doing it in their free time often in evenings and uh, weekends, and every paper is bespoke. So it's not a, just a sort of off the shelf, we can just run an exam. Uh, it has to have really um, sort of robust quality uh, assurance to make sure that it's a, a fair uh, exam. So I think, you know, the college isn't doing nothing. We, we're hearing the demand, we would love to respond, uh, but there's a cost involved in that. And it's always, you know, uh, working out what capacity we have and balancing the books at the end of the day. So um, keep telling us what you want uh, and what's helpful, uh, and we will do our best to adapt to that. But I think our priority at the moment is delivering a high quality, safe and fair cast exam and two written papers in the autumn. Uh, you know, hopefully in the future we can develop it from there. Great, thank you very much. And the very final question, hopefully in 30 seconds, please, panel. Um, if a candidate chooses not to take part in the digital format of the CASC, um, what will happen to the validity period of their examinations, if anything? Um, yes, I was going to talk about the future exam anyway, so I'll sort of merge into that perhaps. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think our position would be you no, know, we're, we're offering an exam in um, September, so we wouldn't extend the validity period because you elected not to take it. I think this is the exam that, that that's being offered, and I'm sure the validity period is something that the GMC have put on us because they want to limit attempts at the um, at, at all of the postgraduate medical exams. So, so I think in terms of the principles they want us to operate on, we wouldn't extend the validity period then. But if it's okay, Luke, should I go on now to talk about the future, or did you want to close? I just wanted to say one thing, actually. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the panel, Kate, Ian, Ashke, Will, and Richard, for being here. Um, and just to say, um, I think it's really fantastic that you've allowed trainees to submit questions and put you on the spot, really, and ask you some really challenging questions. So from the PTC and, uh, and myself, uh, we really appreciate that and are very grateful that you've allowed us to do that and have given up your time for the last uh, hour. So thank you, panel, uh, from me for being here. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Um, so just about the future of the exam, with the written papers, we're, uh, we're almost certain to carry on delivering using the digital uh, platform. Uh, and uh, I can't see that changing because I think that's definitely uh, the way things are going. And I think um, it'll deliver a good uh, experience for the, for the for, for trainees. With the CASC, um, it's... Uh, I've spoken to lots and lots of people about the cask and what you know what we should do in the future. And um, uh, there is a call for saying, "Oh no, let's keep it online." But I think all the psychiatrists that I speak to actually don't say that and say, "No, we do need to have a proper face-to-face -face ass assessment." That's not to say we might not have a, a video consultation component to it, but we definitely need to put back in face-to-face -face assessments uh, when you know when it's when, when it's possible to do so. So I think. I think that is that that's likely the way it's going. The question obviously is when are we going to um, do that? Um, and I think in because we have to think, you know, about all the social distancing, how difficult it is to do social distancing at a cask, which mixes lots and lots of people up, as anyone who's been there will know. Um, plus the whole thing about travel and um, uh, accommodation, plus the fact that uh, you know people a significant number of candidates might still be shielding. I don't think, I think we're going to deliver the video conference version in, in, in January as well. Um, um, but hopefully, I'm hoping we'll be able to return to face-to-face -face at least by September in Sheffield, September 2021. But, um, but yeah, you know, I haven't got a crystal ball and I don't know what's going to happen uh, with the pandemic. So that's the, 
that, that that's those are our thoughts about the future obviously as, as we've already said uh, we're, we're very keen to hear people's uh, ideas about it as well um, uh, yeah so I think uh, uh, Ross that's all I wanted to say about the future I think you were just going to uh, say a few words to close weren't you Thank you very much, Ian. Um, as, as Luke said, thank you to all our speakers and panellists today. Kate Lovett, Ian Hall, Stephanie Ewan, Luke Baker, Akshay Kasagra, Will and Grace from Fry, as well as Richard from Pearson. Um, I'd also like to thank, as others have done, the excellent work by the Royal College of Psychiatrists who have made today's event possible. Uh, a big team, including Joanna, Katie, Paul, Catherine, Emma and Liz, uh, including the massive work to make the exams work in these difficult circumstances. I just want to say, as we've been putting in the chat, that you can send all those exam-related queries in um, via examinations at rcsite.ac.uk, but please have a good look at the exam section of the website. I wanted to finish with a brief reflection, if, if you if you would indulge me. I, I found my written examinations quite hard. Um, I have to say I sat both papers A and B more than once. My wife kept asking me why I kept failing and, and I kept saying I don't know and kept going red in the face. It took me a long while to work out why. Um, I see now that I didn't seek help with things that I actually didn't understand embarrassingly. I didn't test myself enough and I didn't listen to colleagues who offered good resources and support. It wasn't how hard I was working. When it came to the cask, I was relieved to be practicing in a small group and um, we got uh, some critical friends who were registrars and consultants to come and examine us as it were and that was so useful but the best tip i got was to take a proper lunch break i'm sorry that you can't enjoy the excellent pub surrounding the cast venue this year um, but it was a relief to have a, a touch base with reality away from the exams world so what i wanted to say and to reflect my colleague akshay's thoughts is to seek help and guidance and support and do it early Supervisors, colleagues and local peer support networks are all invaluable. Those critical friends make that performance difference. But please remember also to look after yourselves. We deserve the very same care we advocate for our patients on a daily basis. And we know that this ranges from our friends and family, but also to the deanery and their support networks, as well as our own college and the psychiatry support um, service. So many thanks for joining us today. Please look after yourselves and good luck in your exams. Goodbye.